Before we start this show, just a word from our sponsor. 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest that pro wrestling has had to offer. Along with their awesome line of pro wrestling apparel, they do offer many services. In the world of wrestling, there are hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads. Don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20 by 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. If you would like to discuss possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or whatever, drop them a line. Go to 20 by 20 apparel. That's the number 20 X, the number 20 apparel.com. Now let's get to the show. Fresh, 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 fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suckers bum me, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell and run it You see me shining like a suit on puppy. You know my grind and shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kicks, you can't cop it tomorrow. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 Fresh, God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. And on Fresh of the Word, we like to deliver wisdom through great stories from the minds of bright creatives of pop culture. Through those stories, we like to dissect the journey of our guests and present actionable lessons and advice for our listeners, no matter what career or avenue of artistry they pursue. And before we get into this episode, I want to give a shout out to Knox Money, Bang Belushi, and Foul Mouth for the theme music for Fresh of the Word. And if you would like to support the podcast, you can always go to freshofthepodcast.com and just share any of the links for any of the episodes on any of your social media platforms. And also, you can subscribe to Fresh of the Word pretty much anywhere that podcasts are streamed. And that includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, pretty much everywhere. And please, rate and review, especially on Apple Podcasts. It will definitely help out the show. If you want to contact me, you can always reach me by email at djkfresh at gmail.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at K Fresh is the word, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash kfresh. And you can also follow Fresh is the word on Twitter at fresh is the word, and that's is with an IZ, Instagram at fresh is the word podcast, and Facebook at facebook.com slash fresh is the podcast. And this is episode 149. The guest for this episode is Ronnie Cycli, former NBA basketball superstar, now electronic music producer. Cycli, born in the war-torn Lebanon, was the ninth overall pick in the 1988 NBA draft by the then new expansion team Miami Heat. He would go on to have a basketball career spanning 12 years beyond the NBA in Barcelona. After his retirement from basketball, Cycli became a successful real estate developer and eventually would add successful electronic music producer and DJ to his vast resume. Cycli has now DJed across the world and has an extensive discography of music and mixes. Just check his SoundCloud page. And uh, recently, Cycli had a new track, Groove It, a part of the Saved Records Collection G compilation. During our chat, we talked about his love for music since a very young age, about always having a backup plan when you are an athlete, reinventing yourself, the lessons learned throughout the phases of his life, his upcoming documentary on Close Up 360, and the trailer will be on the show notes for this episode at freshofthepodcast.com. 
Growing up in the war-torn country of Lebanon, his feelings when he was drafted into the NBA, how he learned the ropes in anything he did, his time in the NBA and how it differs from the game now, and how he's been able to mold his unique sound as an electronic music producer and DJ. Before we get into this interview with Ronnie Cycli, I just want to remind you that Fresh as the Word does have a Patreon set up now so you can help support what Fresh of the Word has been doing for so long, for three years now, over three years. If you go to patreon.com slash Fresh of the Word, for as little as a dollar a month, you can help out Fresh of the Word. There's a few tiers of how you can help Fresh of the Word. And with the $3 a month tier, you will be, have access to my deep, deep archives of interview audio from the past of things I've done outside of Fresh of the Word. I've already had two Patreon-only episodes up. The first with Danny Brown with an interview back from June of 2008. And then episode two was with hip-hop legend Cool Keith, an interview from back in June of 2010. So again, go to patreon.com slash Fresh of the Word and help a brother out. All right, let's get on to the interview with Ronnie Cycli. You know, I grew up during the era that you were in the NBA. That was like, um, I was such a big for- a sports fanatic when I was a little kid. And um, like the NBA, that was like a really cool time uh, when, when you were a part of it. And um, like when I, when I look to what you've done, you know, thus far today, you know, becoming this electronic music um, DJ and artist, like the first thing that comes to mind is that... Uh, Okay, this guy was not afraid to reinvent himself. He had uh, plans after basketball. You know, kind of talk about like that, the idea of, you know, not being scared to reinvent yourself. I mean, it is, to tell you honestly, um, even when I was in college, when I went to Syracuse, always in the back of my mind, I always thought, what would I do? in case something happened to me. If I get injured or my basketball career is not good or I don't make it to the NBA or whatever that may, the case may be, what would I do? And that's where it started. It started as, uh, as, a, as a young kid playing basketball at the highest level. You would think that, you know, all I'm thinking about is just that. But in the back of my mind, I always had, I always had something, you know, nagging me and telling me what's plan B, what's plan B. So... When, when I finished, when, when, obviously, during my uh, NBA career, my plan B was always uh, to be a successful businessman and invest my money in the right place in the right way that that money should be able to last me for the rest of my life and uh, by investing it properly and doing the things. But, you know, I just, I, it was always in the back of my mind. In the midst of all this, I was always into music. I always uh, loved music, and I was always around music, and I always uh, uh, DJed uh, for friends and family. I always had clubs in my house. It was everywhere I, I had a house, I always built like a little club in there. And uh, so I never really thought that this was the the, the 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 DJing part of it. Never, I never thought that this was going to come as a, a public thing. I always thought that this is a hobby. This is kind of in the closet thing that I do because uh, I love it. And I don't need to get criticized for it or you know for people to start wondering. And that's you know. And then when started, people started hearing me and stuff, I said this, you know you should you have a, uh, a specific sound that nobody usually plays. And I think it's a shame if you don't play out. And this is where the reinvention process came in. You know, I, I, I knew that I had to deal with people saying, what the hell does he know about music? Uh, whether he just, wants to, he just wants to be in the limelight, he wants this, he wants that. And I knew that I was going to be faced with all these things. And it, and it wasn't easy in the beginning because the first reaction to anybody is he's either broke he, or he's trying to stay in the limelight or he's trying to make money or, you know, it's always that case. So you have to be strong enough uh, in your own skin if you love something enough 
to basically ride it out and prove everybody wrong and do what you do best and what you lo- love to do. And that's reinvent- uh, the, the, by reinventing myself. Yeah, like during your life, you're someone who came from a war-torn country, came to the, you know, went to the NBA, you know, used uh, your your money, invested it well, and now you're, uh, you know, in the music industry. And that's like, it's like such a, you know, great thing. Like along that, along the way, what have you learned from each of those sort of chapters in your life that kind of helped you get into the next chapter? You know, what did you learn, you know, growing up that helped you in the NBA? What, what did you learn growing up in an NBA that helped you with your uh, post NBA life, you know, invest in your money and being a musician? I think that uh, the one thing that is a trait of uh, mine is the harder you work, the luckier you get. So if you love something and you work your ass, uh, ass off for whatever that is, and you just be, you know, you do your thing and you do it as, as hard as you can. And then when luck comes and you're in the right place at the right time with the luck and the preparation, that's the key to success. When you were, you know, making this change to become a DJ and a producer, you know, how did you sort of uh, like get through the obstacles, all the naysayers being like, oh, what's this old NBA player doing being a techno DJ? (laughs) You know, how did you sort of get past all of that? Uh, because I remember from my, you know, from my MBA days, I'm just going to refer that back to my MBA days. And, you know, uh, and, you know, you have the press and everybody has, uh, you know, writes an article about you. But the ultimate respect you get as a player is if you have your, 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 the respect of your peers. So as long as you have the respect of your peers, it doesn't matter what reporters or whatever these people say, because they're just trying to make a story. They're trying to sell newspapers. And the most important gauge is what other players think. So I knew that other players respected the fact that I played hard in the way I played. Same thing in the DJing. You know, when I, I don't, I, I didn't really care what anybody saw because I knew that some of the best DJs in the world have heard me play and they were pretty shocked to know that this is, really me (laughs) and the fact that i got all those great djs come to my house and listen to me play uh has basically you know i didn't care what the naysayers said i just always knew that it was just a matter of time and how long do i want to push this and how long do i I, can, can i persevere to finally get my sound out there uh which is a different sound to other uh, to other DJs and stuff like that. So, so uh, that was what what kept me. I, I knew that I was. I, I knew that I had something. I knew that I had something not because of the naysayers. I knew I had something because of all these amazing DJs telling me, "Bro, you got something." You know what I mean? And that's right. just that's the thing. That's the thing that you gotta. If you got something, you gotta follow that dream and you gotta chase it and you gotta make sure that you're prepared and ready to go. So when it's, when you when your time. Uh, if it happens, it happens. Uh, the thing is, for me, with music, is I don't really have a goal. I really don't have a goal. I, this is a passion for me. I would do this for free. I'm not doing this for money. I don't do this for fame. I do this every single day in my daily life. I'm either making music, listening to music, or being around music. So uh, this is a passion for me. And if, if I don't play any gigs or I don't do anything else, I'll still be doing the same thing. When did you first get the music bug? When did you first like remember wanting to do something in music? Uh, when I was 14 years old, I turned my parents' garage into a club. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I had uh, two record players, a mixer, and a, you know, a nice sound system, the lights, the whole thing. So I uh, played basketball then. So, but, you know, at, at uh, 14, 15, you don't really have a place to go out. So I would invite, invite all those friends over to come in, uh, and uh, hang out in the room. And, uh, and then at that point, uh, you know, I would start charging people some um, uh, little bit of, you know, a couple of dollars here and there. 
and I would use the money to upgrade the system and the lights and whatever it is. So it started when I was 14. It's not, this is not something that just started at 50. Who were, you know, some of the DJs or producers that you were interested in at that time? Um, Back then, I was, uh, you know, back then it was all about uh, the disco. I, I grew up on disco. I really loved disco. And then when I morphed into house music, I really loved uh, Frankie Knuckles and, uh, you know, all those old school house DJs. Yeah. And unfortunately, back then, the DJ wasn't the center of attention. The DJ was just kind of like, you know, that guy's playing. Yes, we're going to go check him out and listen to him. But it isn't as forefront and, and, and centerpiece as it is today to the whole, to the whole industry. So I've seen, I've seen, I mean, I've owned uh, four different clubs in Miami, in Miami Beach, going back to 1991 or 92 was my first club in Miami Beach. So, you know, I've, I've known the, 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 I've known that world since back then. How did you, uh, what was your experiences with, you know, owning these clubs back then? You know, what was some of the like the things that the things that really stick out in your mind during those times? Well, I think at, at the time I just wanted to be in the music business somehow. I just wanted to be connected to, to music and uh, being on the road playing the NBA. I didn't want to go to clubs and uh, you know, I just figured I'll invest in this club. I'll get to hear the music and I'll get to hear and I'll get to uh, be treated properly and uh, you know not kind of uh, get uh, thrown you know what I mean like you know you go to a different club and you gotta call people to take care of you whatever so thinking playing in my own club was gonna kind of cut all that uh, out of the way so it was like a semi investment and semi thing that I wanted to do just as long as the investment was good enough and this wasn't something that we were investing in that was a, that, that's a complete loss so uh i invested with some great guys uh throughout and uh and it's made money uh throughout so i'm uh i'm pretty pleased that i made that investment but that's kind of what kept me in the game while i was in the nba game your your publicist mentioned that there's going to be a documentary about your life coming up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Talk about that a little. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people, it's funny because a lot of people like, you know, you know we were just talking about, you know, you grew up in the, uh, watching basketball in the nineties. That was my era nineties. And, uh, and uh, that was the Michael Jordan, you know, they had like marquee players on it on every team and stuff like that. So, uh, fast forward 20 years later, uh, and now you got the kid that goes home and tells his dad, oh, I was at the club and I saw uh, Ronnie Cycli play a uh, play DJ. And, he, and then they would have this argument of Ronnie Cycli, the DJ. Who, uh, I know <laughs> Ronnie Cycli, the, 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 the basketball player. And he said, no, he's not a basketball player, he's a DJ. So there was always this kind of confusion as if the basketball player was at the DJ. And then after a while, it came about that it was actually both, both. Right. <laughs> the same guy. So uh, there is a uh, there is a reporter, uh, uh, Jared Swirling, that he's he's been he's an amazing. He's with Sports Illustrated. He's been with Bleacher uh, Report. He's had uh, an amazing career as a as a journalist, uh, and has started this kind of docu series on athletes and basketball players and what, what it's all about. And he reached out to me, he says, you, you know, your story is just crazy. Uh, the, you know, it's completely, uh, you know, w- growing up in a war and, you know, making it out alive and coming back to live in the States and, and then have this r- like a res- resurrection of, of another kind of public uh, persona in music. So you kind of had three careers in a you know in a short span of life where people still trying to find their one career and so they thought it was an amazing it was an amazing uh, it would be an amazing documentary to kind of follow me through those uh th- through that journey being an nba player or just like an athlete in general how important is it to have those 
plan B's or even plan C's when at any moment your career can be over? I think that it's insane for people not to be thinking about that um, at par with their present career. I mean, it is just, uh, you know, whether it's here in the music or in the entertainment business or the sports business, you basically have a shelf life. Uh, and that, that's it. And that's your shelf life. Uh, you know, this is not like a businessman that can work for 40, 50 years and, and just get promoted and keep going about his work. When you're in this line of business, entertainment, sports, and stuff like that, you know, you've got a very short life. So if it's not, you know, what's the average uh, lifespan of an NBA player? I think it's three and a half years to four years. That's the average span of an NBA player. Wow. So, yeah. So, you know, okay, so you, you work, uh, you, you do what you got to do in those two, three years, four years, and then what? And it's the same thing for modeling. It's the same thing for, uh, you know, for all these girls that are making all this money. Yeah, you're hot, but you got to always remember that all of us have an expiration period. And you've got to make the best of what's next. As somebody who grew up in a war-torn country like Lebanon, you know, and then becoming a successful athlete, businessman, you know, what, you know, what did you learn as a, you know, growing up in such a war-torn area that sort of still stays with you with things going on today in society? Um, I think growing up in a war teaches you to stand up for yourself and make sure that, uh, you know, that you go through walls if you have to. It, it gives you that, it, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a, uh, you know, riding my bicycle to school and every day was a great day and uh, whatever. I, I grew up in a war where we saw dead bodies on the streets where, you know, we would have to take different roads because there were snipers on the buildings. Uh, so you have that kind of like, you've got to be a survivor and that is what that whole thing taught me is how to be become a survivor what advice would you kind of give to anybody listening to this podcast that you know is afraid to sort of reinvent themselves well what i can what i usually tell a lot of people is that if everybody stays in their comfort zone then <clears throat> nothing is going to happen uh, because that's your comfort zone. The magic happens outside the comfort zone. And the reason it happens is because it's outside your comfort zone. So you got to get out there and see what's out there. And maybe, you know, it takes you through different journeys and trips and whatever, but ultimately you'll get somewhere out of being out of your comfort zone. And that's, that's the most important thing, I think. How do, how do you feel you were able to gain respect in everything that you did, whether it's from your, uh, the peers in the NBA or these days in the music industry? I think hard work. I think uh, people know if, you're, if, you, if it's something you absolutely love, whether you have a good game or a good gig or whatever it is, everybody can, can screw up. Everybody can have bad days and whatever. But the most important thing is how do you bounce back from those bad games or bad days? And do you, do you know, adversity is the biggest, um, is the biggest thing that anybody has to deal with. Some people take on adversity and say, okay, I got knocked down. Now I got to get back on my feet and keep going. And some people say, you know what? I got knocked down. I can't do this anymore. So it depends on, on the mindset that you have. But I think that the respect comes from people knowing that I, when I decide to do something, I'm going all the way with it. I'm not cutting corners. When you uh, realized you'll be going to the NBA, you know, back then, what was going through your mind when, you, when, when that moment happened? I mean, it's, you know, at the time you're, you're a young uh, kid and everything happens so fast. Uh, I didn't have the NBA growing up on TV. I barely watched any games. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew what I read, and that was kind of, you know, when the playoffs, who wins and who doesn't. But I wasn't really uh, somebody who grew up in this world and understood uh, what it was all about. So, And then when it happened, everything happened so fast. I didn't even have time to think. Like, I was almost like, 
you know, I set a goal to make it to the NBA, and that was my goal. And then I made it there, and I got there. And, you know, and the most important thing is now, how, now that I'm here, how do I stay here for a while? And that's, the, you know, the constant um, competitiveness that I have within me that keeps me going. These days, I've really been interested in sort of the idea of mentors, mentorships, you know, people, you know, learning from the people before you, you know, during this journey, whether it was with music or with the NBA or with uh, any of the business ventures that you've done, you know, was there, you know, what do you feel like is the definition to, of a mentor to, uh, for you? And did you have anybody that you looked up to that really helped you along the way? I never, unfortunately, I, I didn't have any mentors because, uh, you, you know, when I did make it to the NBA, I made it to, an, uh, you know, it was the expansion year of Miami Heat. So I was the number one pick for that expansion team. And everybody was pretty much uh, young players or older players that, are, that uh, other teams didn't want. So they kind of let them go. So I didn't have that guy, you know, put his arm around me and say, you should do this, you should do that. I basically learned everything in the line of fire. I had to learn on my own and figure it out on my own and uh, do whatever I had to do on my own. That's a, that's a, you know, can be a tough road, you know, and what, you know, through that journey, you know, what did you learn by that sort of, trial and error, I would guess you could say, you know, doing it by yourself, you know, what did you learn through that journey? Well, that is, you know, when you try to figure it out uh, by yourself, it takes a lot longer. And uh, I wish I had that person that I could, that uh, I looked up to and said, listen, you know, he, here's some of the shortcuts you need. And here are some of the things that you need. Uh, I only figured them out on my own. And that's why the process is a lot longer when you're trying to do things on your own. Uh, if somebody already has the, uh, uh, the, the, the way to do it. During your time in the NBA, who are some of your favorite players to play with? You know, what, you know, who kind of sticks out in your mind? Like who do you, like you, the, your favorite players to play with? And then who are some of your favorite players to play against for whatever reason? Well, I think, uh, uh, Steve Smith, uh, Glenn Rice, yeah, and Grant and Grant Long were uh, my favorite teammates uh, in the pros. Uh, Derek Coleman and Sherman Douglas were my favorite. Uh, Stephen Thompson was uh, one of my favorite at Syracuse. But um, you know, those are those, Steve Smith is uh, and Brian Shaw. You know, now I'm, I'm trying. I love playing with Brian Shaw. He was an amazing uh, player, and I and uh, and playing against some of the players, I, you know, obviously my, my first game playing against Larry Bird, I played a game against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was like, you know, I was shell-shocked. I was like, <laughs> you know, what is this kid from Lebanon doing? You know, it's almost like all surreal. Like, you know, right. you, don't, you, don't, you, you see it in front of you, but you don't know what's going on. It's just kind of everything is happening. Uh, seeing, mag uh, seeing magic, playing against magic when he had HIV, um, all these things uh, meant so much to me. And then obviously uh, the fierce competitors like Shaquille O'Neal and, uh, and Akeem Olajuwon and Carl Malone and all those guys were, and playing against the bad boys of Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all those were amazing, uh, amazing memories. For me, uh, back then, you know, every team had uh, their two, three, four guys that can play. You know, there, there's every team was stacked with great players. Uh, so um, it was there was never a night off for me as a center, uh, as an undersized center, as an undersized center for that matter. And uh, you know, going up against. Uh, David Robinson, Tim Duncan, uh, uh, Shaq, Alonzo Mourning, uh, Mutombo, um, Patrick Ewing, Robert Parrish, and the list goes on and on. Uh, so every night was uh, a, a, I had to face the beast. 
Yeah, when you go back to the you know the eighties and the nineties of the NBA, you know that that was a tough time. You know, players are basically like fighting on the court. You know, it was just is ruthless. Uh, do you still like these days follow the NBA? And from your perspective, what's the difference between that era that you were from than what you see today? I mean, there's nothing. There's there's nothing to compare between this era and era. It's a it's a new brand of basketball. It's it's much faster. It's a lot. It's you know the the, the games uh, are uh, scoring games. There's a lot more things like you know. I think athletically, people have gotten much more athletic and all that. But back in the day, it was a little more structured, meaning that uh, you know the point guard. Did his job of this, you know, of setting up the offense, distributing the ball. The small, uh, the, the shooting guard did that. He just, you know, got open and shot the ball. Uh, the small forward was the slasher. The power forward was your, you know, your big guy inside, rebounding, doing all the dirty work, and your center is the, the guy protecting everything in the back. And that was pretty much like, you know, what basketball um, role play was. Everybody had to do their job. Today's game is completely different, whereas everybody does a little bit of everything, and uh, so you don't know who's, the, you know, the, you don't know the center from the foul forward, from the small forward, because, you know, back in the day, I don't remember any of the big guys going out there and shooting threes, whereas today all those guys are shooting threes. <laughs> I don't know where the philosophy has changed in the sense that, you know, I, I, I still, I just think that there isn't any. You know, there isn't a lot of big men that can play with their back to the basket. And I think it's gotten uh, uh, to a kind of a shorter, much smaller, quicker game. But I still believe in the philosophy that if you've got a monster down low that can play with his back to the basket and can attract double and triple teams with the way people are shooting and with the athletic ability of today, I think that's where the NBA game is going to go next. I think it's going to be a combination of what we saw in the 90s and what we see today. It's a little bit of both and that's when the basketball weather that's when it's going to be uh, super interesting to watch. Right, right, right. These days, you know, you're making music and uh recently there you have a new track it's on um, that's out. It's called Groove It. Talk uh, about that uh that track. I mean, listen, I don't I I I, I I make uh, music uh, all the time. You know, there is, uh, I just get uh, inspired by listening to something. I just did a track using Alan Iverson's vocals. Oh, nice. Uh, Yeah, I used Alan Iverson's um, interview when he was talking about practice. Practice? And turned it into, yeah, and I turned it into a a deep house track. I, uh, I I reached out to some of his people to see if he minded if I released it, but I never heard back. So anyway, we're we're probably going to go with the release anyway. But uh, so I get inspired by different things. Sometimes I mix uh, the uh, some some of the old uh, things that I have, uh, you know, from the older house music stuff, and kind of combine it with what's happening today. So. It all depends on the mood and the and uh, and what I'm feeling and what and what is giving me the uh, the idea of what I want to do. With you know always you know just doing music like you said, whether or not you're gonna it's just something that you do every day. You know what's your plans coming up? Uh, is there anything that we should look out for? You know uh, festivals, releases. You know what, what are you gonna be doing soon? Well, the thing, the releases, every, I have my own label, and I release uh, music every, um, um, you know, six weeks probably, every five, six weeks. I'll release a couple of tracks. Uh, I have a library of hundreds of tracks, so it's always hard to choose which one uh, <laughs> to kind of release to the public. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, it's, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I know that my music in the context of, my, of me DJing, my music, it all works out to kind of have a, you know, of that kind of that sound the whole night. When another DJ plays his style of music and plays my song, it kind of doesn't fit into the box. And that's where, that's why I started my, my, my own uh, label called Strive. 
Because I figure that all my music, every time I send it to different labels, they keep telling me it's good, but it doesn't fit into the box <laughs> that they're looking for. So it kind of get, got me frustrated, like, okay, well, I mean, um, I, I don't stand because I'm playing it. It's resonating uh, on the dance floor, but then the label says, well, it's not in the box. So I, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to get out of this whole chase and do my own thing and release the music that I want to release. And uh, so, you know, on a, in the context of me playing the music, I will play that music within the set, but it, it's all like that kind of music, so it all fits in, you understand? So right. it's a little bit different. How does it sort of uh, feel, you know, what's the, the freedom that you feel when you're like, this is kind of like my own sound, you know, what's, you know, how important is it for you to like stand out and not be a part of that box, um, you know, sort of speak? I think the most important thing and the people that make a difference in this world are the people that stick to what they believe. Uh, everybody wants to put you in the box. You go back to the rock and roll years and, uh, you know, even if you've watched Bohemian Rhapsody, that manager wanted to put them in that box and they kept saying, no, we don't want to go there. We want to do what we want to do. And that's pretty much my whole thing is that I was always outside the box musically and it took a while for people to kind of understand, oh, wow, this, he has his own style. And for me, the hardest thing in the world, and especially as a DJ, is to, to have your own style. So when people are walking by, they say, oh, this must be Ronnie playing because they know from the sound of it. So that is very rare to have. Only the top DJs in the world have a sound. And, and that, you know, everybody else that's a DJ is basically uh, either wanting to be whoever that guy is or playing music that that guy is playing. You understand? So they're basically right. always following uh, what the trend is and they're just kind of playing it safe and doing what they have to do to play it safe and, and get booked and, and become a DJ. And my mindset is, listen, I, I have a completely different style of music and I am playing it. And if you don't like it, then it's too bad, but I'm not changing. <laughs> what do you hope your crowd, you know, your listeners get out of your experience, whether it's just listening to your tracks or being at the club, listening to you, DJ? I think it's, uh, I think that if you're in, you know, if you, if you listen to underground music and, uh, and you know, um, culture of this music and what it's all about you know we don't it's it's not like edm or anything that's commercial and stuff like that so it's the it's the little details in the tracks that make the difference in the tracks almost like classical music classical music had no vocals had no uh nothing but it's always the intricate details within the track that kind of got your attention it's like wow you know whatever that is so in our culture, in, in the underground world, making music is all about that. It's all about the small little details here and there that you get and come in and come out and kind of uh, take you on this, uh, on this uh, voyage. So uh, if you are not a, uh, you know, an underground listener, to you it's just going to go fly over your head. You understand what I mean? Because you're not listening to the small details. You're listening to the buildups and to the big you know, to the, to the vocals and to right. the big stuff that happens within a song. So, uh, so that, that is, you know, so if, if, if somebody that doesn't know our music listens to my music, they're going to be like, what the hell is this? <laughs> because they don't really know what it is. But that's not, who, that's not who I'm chasing, and that's not who I'm playing for. Right. To kind of wrap things up, when... When everything's said and done, you've had this, you are already had this very interesting life, you know, different careers, you've reinvented yourself. You know, what do you hope your legacy is? Uh, I don't, uh, honestly, I don't, I just, uh, I just want to uh, be a person that has made a change uh, in any way I could, you know, and, uh, I'm always thinking like, you know, everybody has a purpose in life and, uh, 
you if you if you take advantage of whatever purpose it is and, and make a change and, and put a smile on somebody's face and do what you got to do to be uh, to to live your life to its fullest and uh, I can honestly tell you that I live my life to its fullest and I do everything I can to to the max so I have zero regrets and uh, and that is the legacy I will leave behind that I did exactly what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And I did it as hard as I could, as long as I could. Great. Well, Ronnie, it's been great talking with you, man. Like, like I said, you're, you came from uh, the time of basketball that I was really into. So it was really an honor to talk, um, to talk with you. Um, where can people go online to get more information about what you're doing and listen to your music? Well, there's, I mean, uh, I have a radio show that's been airing for the past six to seven years on Sirius XM called Sugar Free Radio. Um, and that's been going on every single week for the last seven years. Uh, and those po- and all those uh, radio shows are on my SoundCloud page. So everybody can uh, listen. Uh, let's go to SoundCloud and, and, and uh, listen to those mixes. They're more on the Deep House vibe. And... Uh, and that's one way. Another way is Spotify, obviously. And then, uh, and uh, otherwise, come out and see me in person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. It's been great talking with you, definitely. And thank you for uh, taking the time out to chat with me. Thank you so much. That was my interview with Ronnie Cycli. More information about Ronnie Cycli, his music, his upcoming documentary will be in the show notes for this episode at freshesthepodcast.com. It was great talking with Ronnie Cycli. He came from that part of the NBA that I watched as a little kid, and I thought that was a really awesome age of, of the NBA. There's good players now, but it just isn't the same game. And oh yeah, if you're in Toronto over this weekend, meaning between May 9th to the 13th, I'll be in town for the Toronto Comics Arts Festival, and I will be doing a spotlight panel on Saturday the 11th for the book Death Threat by by Vivek Sharaya and illustrated by Ness Lee. We're going to be uh, talking about the book, the inspiration behind it during this panel. Uh, For more information about that panel, you can always go to torontocomics.com and all the information about the uh about tcaf and everything else that's going on during that festival will be on the website they have a really good website with everything that is going on in the times and how you can sign up it's it's a total free festival and it looks awesome and i can't wait to be in toronto this weekend that's another episode in the books thank you for listening goodbye and good night Fresh, 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 fresh is the word.